we're going to get into defining what computability theory is and starting to work towards a definition of what it means to be computable, which is no easy task. Um, in fact, that's going to be one of the hardest parts. So uh, let's start by defining what it is. Um, and by defining what it is, I'm going to actually write here what it's concerned with. So I'm going to say computability theory is concerned uh, with the capabilities of algorithmic processes. With the capabilities of algorithmic processes. Now, Obviously, there's some stuff I need to talk about there. For example, uh, what do I mean by the word algorithmic? Um, well, by algorithmic, what I really mean is, well, let me just write down what it means. An algorithm is a set of instructions, really. It's, it's a well-defined set of instructions, which can be uh, followed mechanically. That is kind of without thought, right? Uh, I.e., without any extra thought. Put that in quotes. Now, uh, even that, right, is too informal. There's, there's going to be a. I mean, that's why I had to. That's why I felt like I had to have an entire video, um, sort of preparing you for this kind of math because, um, this is going to be a long process of formalization. We're going to have to talk very philosophically, very at a high level, and then sort of, you know, do what Marx and David Harvey were talking about. We've got to dive down in order to try to formalize this. But I really do think it's important to try to start with the informal and from the informal get to the formal because the definition of a Turing machine and the definition of computable, which is even more complicated than a Turing machine, uh, are they're very difficult. They're very complicated definitions. There's a lot going on. And I think there's needs, we need to talk a lot before we just write it down. But what we're talking about is processes that can be done uh, without, you know, with a set of instructions. Um, so, you know, maybe some examples. Uh, I don't want to just focus on, you know, obviously computer programs, right? You can write a, you can, you know, that's the typical thing, right? You write down your Java program, and then you end up with some kind of machine that does something for you. Maybe it, maybe it does some kind of math operation. Maybe it runs an infinite loop that renders things on a screen, right? Maybe it processes credit transactions. But it's always, it's always just a, 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 dis, a, dis, a distinct set of instructions. But that's not all. That's not the only things that are that computability theory pertains to, right? I mean, it pertains to a lot more than that. For example, cooking instructions, right? If you're doing, uh, if you're cooking something and you're following instructions, that's an algorithm. Another one would be, you know. Math functions like, um, you know, f of x. Whoops, let me try that again. Still getting used to this pen. Can I make it a little thicker? Yeah, that's better. Right, so f of x equals 5x plus 8, right? This is an algorithm, right? This is an algorithm. What it says to do is if I plug in a number here, it says, what, I, what do I do to that number? I multiply it by 5. And then I add eight to it. That's an algorithm. So this is a function uh, which is defined by an algorithm, by a a set of instructions on what to do to the input. Now, not all functions are defined like this. Not all functions are defined by an algorithm, uh, but this one is. This one says take take x, multiply it by five, and add eight. And you're more familiar with the non with the less algorithmic functions than you realize. For example, f of x equals sine of x. Right? I mean, if you've ever seen this, how do you actually calculate sine of x? Well, there is a computable process, but it you know the the, the process of deriving that is not simple. And that requires some calculus. Um, so it's not always simple to, but we can still talk about it, right? We can still talk about the y-axis of where you are in the unit circle with respect to a, an input. So this function is not defined by an algorithm, although you can do it, but this function is. There's a difference between those two. Um, you know, other 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 algorithmic or, or algorithmic processes that this theory is going to pertain to would be um, assembly lines, right? Assembly lines that convert raw materials into things like cars. That uh, that's a computable process. That's 
you know, there's a, there's a set of rules that dictate how, you know, what's going to happen to all of these raw materials. So any process that, it, that you can mechanize is what we're talking about when we talk about computability theory. And then there's a big one, which you're not, which maybe uh, we're not too sure about, which is to what extent is human thought like that? So, and in fact, let me, let me go ahead and um, uh, let me go ahead and let's just write down some of the kind of more philosophical questions. What the heck? Some of the more philosophical questions uh, that I kind of want to, that, that, that we should keep in the back of our heads um, as we go through this stuff. So uh, I'll start with this one. So some questions to keep in mind. So one, man, if I type, if I type tab, it kind of breaks things. Uh, one, um, are all problems solvable by algorithms? Uh, and then a new, another related question that's going to become the focus of the of of this class eventually is, um, uh, are all of these problems of the the problem solvable? You know, okay, let me write it like this. If a problem is solvable by an algorithm, is it solvable efficiently? Now, again, there's tons of, of informal stuff that we've got to flesh out here. What is, a pro what is a problem? What do I even mean by that? We're going to have to formalize that. What does it mean for a problem to be solvable? That's actually, I mean, let me go ahead and replace solvable with computable. I'll use those interchangeably. But, you know, uh, and, and, then, and then also we've got to define what efficiency means eventually. And, and, and that, these are all difficult tasks. Um, uh, hello? Okay, so... Another question that I want to ask, um, uh, and, and these are deeply philosophical questions that some of these will be, will be fleshing out formally. And some of these will just have to, I still want to think about, but we're just going to have to keep them in our minds informally as we go. And this one is one of them. To what extent is human thought algorithmic? This is going to be a really interesting question to think about and keep in the back of our heads. And, and the reason that it's go and, and you'll be surprised when we actually define what, what is going to end up being our standard model of computation, the Turing machine, that's going to be modeled not after what you think of today as a computer. It's going to be modeled after exactly what's right here, human thought. We're going to think about a person thinking, and that's how we're going to define our model of a computer. And, and by doing that, this, this question, to what extent is human thought computable, uh, it's going to end up being uh, something that, sh that, that, that haunts us for the entire class. So. Um, and then another thing to be to be haunted by is um, we're familiar. You know, I want to connect this to physics, and I'm gonna I'm gonna write more than this. But we're familiar with uh, you know the discussion, I guess, of um, free will versus determinism, right? This is something that you think about that you end up having to think about philosophically as you learn physics. Um, when learning physics, but to what extent um, is determinist, deterministic the same thing as computable? What is the relationship between these two words, deterministic and computable? They're, they're, go they're going to end up being deeply related, and that's something I want to think about too. Um, that's a question. Um, so in physics, right, the, the main goal of physics is to predict what's going to happen, predict the behavior of physical systems given some initial conditions. Just think about what I said there. That's a, you know, the, the physics seeks rules like Newton's laws or Schrodinger's equation or whatever, I, you know, facts that we can use in order to predict what's going to happen. You can see just from the framing of that, that there's going to be a deep connection between the, the task of physics as a whole and the study of computability theory. And, and the connection is going to be between these two words, deterministic, right? Deterministic means that there's a set of rules that's going to determine what's going to happen. Computable means something more than that. Computable means not only is there a set of rules that determines what's going to happen, but that set of rules can be directly turned into an algorithm 
that can, can sort of mechanize the process of determining what's going to happen. Uh, really, this question is going to connect to this question here. Just because there's a rule, just because there is a, there is a, a deterministic behavior does not mean it's computable. Um, I'm not explaining that very well right now, but because it's hard, because we haven't defined computable yet. But what I will do later is show you an example. I will we will construct together uh, a toy model of a universe that is deterministic, but not computable. We get the worst of both worlds. Not only do we not have free will, right? Because if, you're determin if, the, if the universe is deterministic, then there is no free will. Not only is it deterministic, but you don't even get the luxury of being able to predict what's going to happen using those rules. It's still not computable. So um, we could very well be in a universe that is deterministic, but not computable. Um, let me go ahead and write that down, actually. It's a, it's, it's, um, I'm going to go ahead and spoil it. We'll, go, we'll, we'll get to this later. But computable is going to turn out to imply deterministic. Um, but not the other way around. But deterministic does not imply uh, computable. And in the same way, uh, we're going to have a question about proof versus truth. Obviously, if there's a proof of it, then you've discovered some truth. But what about the other way? Just because there's truth, does that imply that there's a proof? So here's another kind of related, we have a one-way street, we have one thing. I mean, I can, we can kind of see why this is true without doing any formalism. If something is computable, then sure, it's deterministic. I have the algorithm. Of course, there's, there, there are the rules right there. Um, it's the other way that's, that's not true. That's not necessarily the case. Likewise, over here, if I have a proof of something, okay, sure, then it's true. Then the thing I've proven is the truth. But just because there's the truth does not, does not necessarily imply proof. This is something we need to think about. And, and this is, again, the connection what the connection is going to be between computability theory and, and, and formal logic and, and, and just kind of meta mathematics as a whole. To what extent can mathematics itself be automated by computers? That was a big motivating question that led to this entire field be developing in the first place. So that's, that's kind of, uh, those, those are kind of some of the broader philosophical things that we're going to be repeatedly touching on throughout the whole, the whole thing. Um, so what I want to do now is we want, so our first task, go ahead and scroll down a bit. So our first goal is to be to define what it means to be computable. That's going to take a little while, a, a, quite a while, actually. Um, the first one, what it means for a problem to be computable. Defining a problem is going to be, defining what I mean by problem is going to be significantly easier than defining what it means to be computable. Um, and we're going to define pro, we're going to define multiple types of problems. So the problems that we're going to be centrally interested in, in this, in, in, in my lectures here, the problems we are uh, mostly interested in are decision problems. I wish you could underline. I want to underline this because this is an important like vocab word. But I'll, I'll underline it with my own pencil. Um, our decision problems. And what I mean by decision problems are problems with in which the answer is yes or no. These are very simple kinds of problems, and that's the reason that we want to focus on them. They're sort of the atomic form of any problem. Um, it's going to turn out that most other kinds of problems, function problems, um, optimization problems, stuff like that, those, pro those kinds of problems will always be deeply related to the decision problems. And the results that we find about decision problems are going to turn out to uh, immediately correspond to answers to the same questions about the other kinds of problems. Focusing on decision problems we're gonna, are going to turn out to lose us virtually nothing. Um, and they're simpler 
they're going to be simpler things to formalize as mathematical objects because that's that's an important thing. Maybe I should write that down. Uh, problems are going to be treated as mathematical objects to be categorized. That's an important thing to note. Um, and I'm, tr I'm trying to decide, do I want to talk about how to do that right now? Um, I'll go ahead and underline some stuff. Set decision problems. OK, so um, how do we define what it means for a problem to be computable? We're going to mostly talk about decision problems, but I do want to talk about problems in general. Uh, well, that was, a non that's, that was a difficult thing to do. Um, let me go ahead and say, informally, what does it mean for a problem to be computable? And informally, a problem is computable. And some other words I'm going to use for computable, um, and we're going to, you know, these are all going to be synonyms, or solvable, or um, uh, uh, recursive. We do use, well, we will use that. You'll see why eventually. Um, if there exists an algorithm for, for solving it or deciding it. And that's another one, decidable. Decidable, computable, solvable. Uh, these are all going to end up, these are all going to be used synonymously throughout what we talk about. If there's an algorithm for deciding it. So if I can write down a set of rules, a set of instructions on how to solve the problem in general, uh, then it is computable. Um, that's the informal definition. And what we want to do is we want to formalize this. That's difficult. Um, and one way we can do that, one way to do this formalization, I promise there will be math, there will be math eventually. It's just, we got to get there. Um, we can, what we can do is what we can do, we can, we can define a model of computation. We can formally, we can define a formal model of computation. Uh, but if we do that, then different models are going to uh, give us different definitions of what it means to be computable. So I can define a formal model of computation uh, from which we can say, that a problem is computable if it can if there is a solution in our model um but that's not really uh but the the problem with that is that other people can define different models of computation but then wouldn't some other model uh, correspond to a different definition of comp of what it means to be computable. So we can define a formal model of computation. So we, what we want to do is we want to formalize this concept of a, of a of a problem being computable if there's an algorithm for it. Well, what do we mean by algorithm? What do we mean by by any of that? Well, we can define a formal model of computation. Uh, and then we can say that a problem is solvable if it's computable within that model. Um, but then other people could make different models. Other people could, de could define different formal models of computation. Uh, and, and for every model of computation, you have a different definition of what computability means. And that's, that's no good. And, in the, and historically, that's what people did. Uh, a lot of different people at a, around the same time were defining their own vert way, their, were coming up with their own definitions of what computability meant. And what happened was they all turned out, gradually people discovered that all of their models were equivalent to, the, to one another. In other words, the set of problems that could be solved with one model ended up always without fail being, uh, being the same as all the others. The, the, it was the same set of problems every time that ended up being computable by this model or that model. And, and you know, in particular, 
they were all equivalent to the one that Turing came up with, the Turing machine. Um, and that's why that's what we're going to do. Um, the, the focus, the model of focus in our class, the model we will focus on is the Turing machine model. And I'll talk about why, why we're going to focus on the Turing model. I don't know if it was the first, but it is the natural one, um, is the Turing machine model. Uh, the church Turing thesis is the result of all of these other models turning out to be equivalent to the Turing model. And it's not a theorem, it's a thesis, as you can see. This is not something that can ever be really proven because there's an infinite number of mathematical models of computation that people come up with. But what we can say is that the church Turing thesis is the claim that any model of computation, any sufficiently uh, um, any sufficiently uh, capable model of computation is equivalent to the Turing model. That's what that's what this historically led to, is this is this this Church Turing thesis. Um, every single model that anyone could come up with just always ended up being as long it, it always ended up being equivalent to the Turing model or less powerful. But the important thing is that it was never any more powerful. And so that led people to the to the conclusion that, wait, we have a definition of computable. Remember, we, what we were trying to do is define computable in general. Every different model comes up with a different definition, but it doesn't. Because if there, it turns out that every model that's sufficiently complicated is just a Turing machine. So all these models were the same. And so through the, form, through the repeated formalization of this informal definition, we sort of end up back at the informal definition, but we understand it better. So that's what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to define the Turing model, which is going to be the main one that, we're, that we discover truth in. Um, but we're going to come up with other models of computation. We're going to define a bunch of models of computation. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to prove that all of them are equivalent to one another, uh, but they are. And so we're going, to, we're going to be led back to this definition of computable. What, is, what does it mean to be computable? It means to be computable within any of these models. Um, they're all the same. And so if you yourself come up with your own definition of computability, it's going to turn out to be the same as the one that I'm using. Um, and that says something really deep about, and, and that's a really good thing because that means that the results that we get in this class can address these really deep philosophical questions. Just because we're working within the Turing model, we can still think about the results that we get about computability from the Turing model and apply that to these questions confident that we do have the right definition, at least from what we intuitively think me computable means, uh, we're thinking about that, right? So hopefully that made some sense. Um, if it didn't, we're going we're gonna to kind of repeat ourselves as we go through it in detail. Um, but what we want to do, oops. But now what we're going to do is we're going to actually start to describe the Turing model. Um, so. The Turing model is the natural one. I said that before. What did I mean by that? Um, what I mean by that is that when Turing first designed the Turing model, when, when Turing first came up with his model of computation, uh, he, computers weren't around. Turing's model of computation is not based on what we now know as computers. Back, back in Turing's day, a, comp a computer was not an object. It was a profession. Back, back in Turing's day, computer was a job. You were the computer for the king. So it was sort of like an accountant job. You would, you would, you would live in the king's court and you would do his finances. Um, a computer was a person. A person. So that's why that's why this model ends up being the important one. That why that's why this model ends up being the one that we want to focus on in terms of its philosophical value, because it's based on people doing. It's it's based on you thinking. 
And so what, in order to start to get towards the definition of a Turing machine, what I want to do is I want to think about what an, what an architect does when he sits down to design a house. So how does an architect design a house? And, and a lot of what I'm going to be describing here, by the way, the credit for the for sort of the the fleshing out of these ideas is is goes definitely goes to a guy named Paul Cockshot. I will put his um, the videos in which he kind of goes into this in more depth in a different context uh, in the description. Um, how does an architect design a house? Well, what he does is they sit down. They start with a they start with a broad but incomplete outline in their head uh, that. Um, so let me go ahead and make this longer. Hello. So they start, I'm going to write, I promise I, I'm going to st start writing stuff down and not typing pretty soon. They start with a broad but incomplete outline in their head. They begin drawing on paper. What then? As they transfer this idea onto paper, what happens? Something happens. At the beginning, the, the, you only have a broad outline. The architect does not have in his head the entire picture of the house at first. The entire design is not there. Instead, what's there is a broad outline. And so what he does is he draws that broad outline on the paper. And then as they transfer that idea to the paper, they get context. They get a context um, on the paper uh, from which they can elaborate and fill in the details. It's a sort of feedback loop. It's a feedback loop of getting ideas. It's an interaction. So the design, the important takeaway is that the design uh, is formed out of the dynamic interaction between mind, pen, and paper. An architect's job is very similar to a mathematician's job, is very simpler, simple, similar to an engineer's job in terms of they are sitting down with a, pencil of, uh, with a pencil and a piece of paper, and their goal is to come up with a, a design for something or come up with a, with, a, with a solution to a problem or come up with something creative, anything. Um, it's not just formed in your head. It's this, it's this process of making something material and then interacting with that material thing you made and, and editing it and adding on to it. And it's this back and forth. Um, and so what we want to model is that. We want a formal model of a human being at a desk with a pencil and a piece of paper and a brain. That's what we want. That's going to be our formal model of a Turing machine. And as we define the Turing machine, which is going to take a while, it's a very complicated definition. And, and the way to keep track of the definition, the way to understand the definition as we go, is to keep this in mind, that this is really what we're trying to model. It's not a computer. It will be a model for computers. But really what it is, is it's the model of a person at a, at a desk with these three objects interacting. In fact, I've got another quote by, Col by Paul Cockshot up here. Whoops. Right at the top, I hit it. I want to read this off. And we're gonna we're gonna keep this in mind for the next video. I think um, I think I'm probably gonna uh, do one more thing, and then we'll actually define a Turing machine in the next video. But I want I want to read this, and we're gonna we're gonna keep this on the screen for the next video too. I'm gonna read it again. Then this is this is not my word. These are Paul Cockshot's words, um, but I want to read it off because it's incredibly important. At any one time, our consciousness can only focus on a limited number of items. On the basis of what, is current, what, it, what it is currently conscious of, its context, it can produce responses related to this context. In, in an activity like drawing a plan or an engineering diagram, the context has two parts, okay? 
an internal state of mind and the part of the diagram on which visual attention is fixated. So at any one time, we have a state of mind, we're thinking about something, and we're staring somewhere on the page. So, you know, here's the page. And maybe we're looking like right here. Right? I, I did not do that well. We're looking at a particular part of the page and, and there's also like, right, we've got, so we've got like, a, I don't know, what, what do I draw data looking like? Stuff happening. So our brain is doing something, we're looking somewhere, and then through, an, through the interaction of what, between what we're seeing and what's in our head, we're going to make an edit. Right, there's an, and, and then also this is going to change. So this changes, let me, let me say it like that actually. So we, we look at something, we're seeing stuff happening. So the internal state of mind is right here. The part of the diagram on which visual attention is fixated is right here. And then the response is going to be a change to this, a change to the page, and a change to this. Both of these things are going to change. Our state of mind is going to change, and what we put down on paper is going to change. They're going to change simultaneously, and then the process repeats itself. And that, right there, is going to be uh, our model for a computer, our model for how a human being does something, does, does an algorithm on paper like this. Uh, and it's going to be, and yeah, so that's that. So in the next video, whoops, in the next video, we'll, we'll, we'll formalize this into a Turing machine.